a woman asked me whether it was okay to get ordained. She was already ordained as a female monk. In our Theravada tradition, female monks no longer exist. But in Mahayana tradition, they still do. Ordination is not that important. But practice or development is. Practice can be pursued at home. There was once a noon who became a female monk. But she did not make good progress in her practice. After she left monkhood, her practice got better. It is not that ordination was bad, but the ordination, especially for a woman, can create a sense of self-superiority. I am an ascetic. I am a female monk. I am more superior to nuns. Female monks also do not get along well with each other. They spend too much time thinking about social acceptance and manipulating their own group. If one spends all day thinking about these topics, development is impossible. If you do not have an opportunity for physical ordination, you ordinate your mind. Determined to keep the precepts and practice, The path can be walked alone. Practicing at home does not require interacting with other people. Maintaining your status or striving for social acceptance, that is tiring. Getting ordained is difficult and getting more difficult for both men and women. In order to stay at this temple, you must get ordained somewhere else. As I am not a designated preceptor, besides, this temple still does not have an ordination hall. To get ordained, one must seek ordination elsewhere. In this province, we rely on three other temples. Kao Bang Sai, Oranyika Wad, and Si Mahar Achar. The head monks at these three temples are all preceptors. They were kind to us and helped people who want to practice at this temple get ordained. The head monk at what Oranyika Wad has just passed and the other two head monks are not well. So, if you want to get ordained and stay at this temple, you must find your own way. Some temples do not trust people who they do not know to get ordained. Some have many conditions to have an ordination ceremony. And the ceremony can be expensive. Some temples require you to buy bowls and robes from them to be ordained. Some require a feast after the ordination. These cost a lot and I do not know how to help. You have to help yourself with getting ordained. Today, many unethical people get ordained. So, the monk ruling body made pre-ordination criminal background checks mandatory. This condition makes ordination more difficult. Appointing a preceptor monk 
is also difficult. It needs to meet many conditions. Finding a preceptor can be challenging due to the scarcity. So, when there are fewer preceptors, they ordain more people. And they do not get to know people whom they ordain. So maintaining the order is difficult. If you have already become a monk, follow the precepts. Getting to wear the robe is difficult. But leaving monkhood is easy. You can leave monkhood by saying the sentence. Remember me as a layperson. This sentence must be said to humans, not trees. There are crazy monks who try to leave monkhood by saying this sentence to trees. Remember that getting ordained is difficult if you are not ready to get ordained. Whether you are full of worldly responsibilities or you still cannot find a place that you want to get ordained at. What can you do? If you are a woman and want to become a female monk, they no longer exist. Many temples do not want nuns. It is difficult to meet their conditions. If this is the case, you practice yourself. Practice mental ordination. Keep the precepts. How many precepts do you intend to keep? The minimum is the five precepts, which is acceptable. Keeping the eight precepts is more rigorous. But keeping the ten precepts as a layperson is too difficult. What distinguishes the eight from the ten? The ten precepts abstain you from carrying money. So, keeping the eight precepts is the most rigorous option for a layperson. So, we resolve to keep the five precepts or the eight precepts to the best extent. Make sure you are capable. Some people do not have good enough health to skip dinner after working all day. They work hard all day and skip dinner and get ulcers. So, consider your physical conditions to make sure your practice is neither self-torture nor self-indulgence. You must have discipline. Practice at home. Let people can attain enlightenment. Many let people attain never eterna during the Buddhist time. But it might be difficult to do this today, as there are too many distractions. During the Buddhist time, some lay people even attained fully enlightened. So, it depends on one's dedication. Keep the precepts and practice diligently. Most lay people still yearn for sensual pleasures. They long for worldly things. So it is difficult for them to be fully enlightened. But it is still possible. In the Buddha's time, the lay people who attained full enlightenment were usually simultaneous attainment, meaning attaining full enlightenment right before death. Why? because they were too occupied with the world until death approached. As death approached, the mind could detach and let go of the body and the mind itself. Many became fully enlightened this way. One was King Suddhodana, Siddhartha, father. Another was Santoti Maharamat. Both passed away the day they attained liberation. Later, it was somehow concluded that if one attained full enlightenment, and did not get ordained in the same day. One would die, 
This kind of thing is in the scripture, but an enlightened one is not afraid of death. If someone is afraid of death and hesitates to attain full enlightenment, they are far from attaining it. I was once with Luang Pu Dun. When someone asked him whether it is true that attaining full enlightenment and not getting ordained will lead to death, Luang Pu gave a good answer. He said, the scripture says so, he did not say it. He then turned to me and asked, if you could attain full enlightenment today, but could not get ordained, and you would die, would you take it? I said yes, death is not something to fear. If the mind is impure, rebirth, and hence death, will come again. But if we could let go of the attachments to the aggregates, and be free from suffering, death does not matter. What dies is not I, but the aggregates. So, if there are reasons preventing you from getting ordained, like taking care of elderly parents, or supporting your children, attend to your responsibilities, practice his mental work. So, practice diligently, keep the five precepts, strive to keep the eight precepts occasionally, People in the old days kept the eight precepts during the Buddhist holy days. They did so at the temple. They took a break from their jobs. This is impractical today. The holy days can coincide with the working days. It is tiring. Skipping dinner may cause ulcers. And if the body deteriorates, practicing is difficult. To practice well, the physical body must be fairly healthy. You do not need to be a bodybuilder, but you must be physically pretty strong. If you can barely breathe, it is very hard to practice. So, we must practice when we are still healthy. If you cannot get ordained, practice well at home. Keep the precepts and practice formal meditation daily. Have a practice object and observe the mind. This will easily lead to samadhi. Without observing the mind, having a peaceful and upright mind is difficult. So, keep observing your mind and practice samadhi. The mind will easily be peaceful and upright. For example, Inhale and silently recite Bood. Exhale and recite Do. Keep observing your mind. See the body breathing with the mind as an observer. After a while, the mind will wander off to think about something else. Know so. When the mind knows that it has wandered off, the wandering and diffusion will cease. The stable mind will arise in its place. It will be peaceful and eventually luminous. The mind will become the knower, the awakened, and the blissful. So, we must practice every day without abandon. I have made this mistake, and it caused me some time. I had been practicing samadhi diligently since I was a child, and I did not see any results. Besides the mind alternating between peacefulness and diffusion, I did not know how to develop wisdom. Once I met Luang Pu Dun, his teaching about observing the mind allowed me to make quick progress. I was a layperson, and practicing can lead to quick progress. So, I looked down on Samadhi's importance, thinking that I spent much time practicing it without making progress. Practicing insight was much better. I could know, see, and understand things in a short time. So I abandoned Samadhi and focused on wisdom development. I kept seeing phenomena arise and cease, until one day my Samadhi was no longer sufficient. Once Samadhi is insufficient, 
corruptions of insides will sneak in. There are ten of these things. If you practice by observing the mind, the one that frequently shows up is brightness or light. Brightness is light. The mind stays with light and emptiness. It is so peaceful. It is like sitting on feces without knowing. The mind is tainted, but you do not know so. You only see light, emptiness and comfort. This is so because the mind is not sufficiently stable. When the mind is not sufficiently stable and diffusion occurs. Mental image or vision follows. The hindrance to practicing peacefulness is mental image or vision. The hindrance to wisdom development is corruptions of insight. These are the traps. Like, if we meditate by observing the breathing. When the mind is half asleep and does not enter absorption. The mind can create many signs. Sign is not only limited to seeing things. It can include mental vision or mental hearing, like hearing the heavenly or ghost beings. It can be a mental smell, both good and bad. Sometimes the water that is flowing out from the shower has a strong good smell. This is a sign of smell. There is also a sign of taste. Sometimes, plain steamed rice can taste so good. This is the result of the mind that is somewhat stable, but is not sufficiently so. This kind of mind will fabricate a lot of these signs that can be perceived by the external five senses. Doing a lot of sitting meditation can be aching. Having a sensual vision of someone massaging the sore spots can occur when you open your eyes. You can see the dents on pressure points on the legs. These are all visions. A mental sign is also possible. The mind seems to enter an absorption and the impurities can trick you in seeing your past lives. Seeing one's past lives can be real or fake. If the mind hasn't yet entered deep absorption, then that vision is fake. It is an illusion. The vision showed that you had been born as significant historical figures. This is so because that vision serves your ego. Or, sometimes, you recall that this woman was your wife in a previous life. But in this life she is not. So you have to win her back. This is getting deluded by visions. or people practicing at home and saw vision of me telling them to come visit. It was time. This is the mind's impurities fooling you. It was a delusion. Someone saw my vision telling them to give me a car. He really brought a car here and gave it to me. That was a serious dedication. So, I told him that I accept his gift. But please immediately take it back. Do not give it to me. The mind was fooled by its own impurities. So, visions can delude us. Do not believe them. How does one overcome delusions of visions? Practice samadhi until the mind is truly upright. All visions will disappear. And when you are cultivating wisdom, seeing the rising and ceasing of phenomena, and the mind is not sufficiently upright, corruptions of insight will occur. How does one overcome corruptions of insight? The mind's true samadhi eliminates all ten of them. So, practicing samadhi is important. If you do not have enough samadhi, your peacefulness practice will be hindered by visions. Your insight, wisdom development practice will be hindered by corruptions of insight. Sometimes the mind can even be tricked into believing 
that it has achieved full enlightenment, so, we must practice Samadhi every day. How do we do so? Take a practice object that you like. Whether it is silently reciting Buddha while breathing, walking, or observing the body parts like hair, body hair, nails, teeth, skin, muscle, ligaments, or bones. In this temple, I am guiding a monk to observe only the bone and not other body parts. He has been doing so until the bones have become translucent and the mind becomes peaceful. Once the mind wanders off to work and stops observing the body, mindfulness will recall that the mind has wandered off to fabricate something. So, choose a practice object and observe your mind. The mind will slowly accumulate strength from being upright until it becomes luminously knowing, awake and blissful. Samadhi is not peacefulness. Samadhi is being upright. So, if the mind is not upright, it wanders off, or it gets absorbed into something. Like, if you observe the belly expanding and contracting, and the mind gets absorbed into it, the mind is no longer upright. The mind got absorbed into the practice object. If you observe the breathing, and the mind gets engrossed by breathing, that is not upright. What will you see if the mind is upright? If you are observing the breathing, the mind will see the body breathing, and the mind is an observer. The mind will see that the body and the mind are two separate entities. The aggregates will separate. Once the mind is upright, wisdom development will happen. The first step of wisdom is being able to separate the aggregates. Like, if you are observing the body breathing, you will see that the body is breathing and the mind is the knower. The body and mind are separated. Samadhi is the immediate cause of wisdom. The first level of wisdom is separating the physical and the abstract. This wisdom will develop and be refined until the mind sees that all physical phenomena arise, stay and decay. The mind will see the same for the abstract. Seeing this is wisdom cultivation. Wisdom can be of many levels. For the basic level, wisdom is a bit guided by thinking. It is of some merit. An example it is thinking about three characteristics of phenomena. The middle level is insight wisdom. The high level is the wisdom that transcends worldly matter. Transcendental wisdom sees the noble truth. Insight wisdom sees elements and aggregates arise, stay and decay. These levels are different. The basic level has some thinking mixed in. Like thinking that the body has the three characteristics of phenomena. Some people who cannot yet start insight practice can start by thinking once the mind becomes sufficiently upright. Insight wisdom will arise. When doing wisdom development at insight level, the mind sees phenomena arise, stay and decay. If the mind lacks samadhi, when it sees phenomena arising and ceasing, corruptions of insight will occur. Once the mind knows so, do a peacefulness meditation until the mind is upright on its base. Corruptions of insight will disappear. The mind will see the phenomena rising, staying and ceasing. It will keep seeing this until the mind gets dispassionate. The mind will see that the world has no refuge. All physical and mental phenomena are impermanent, in conflict and decay and non-self. They are boring, tiresome and scary. You will see that life is so fragile. And so are physical and mental phenomena. Keep practicing. The mind will eventually attain impartiality. Whether physical phenomena are good or bad, they share the same characteristics, rising, staying and decaying. The same applies for all mental phenomena. So, the mind will attain impartiality. And then the mind will enter the process of enlightenment. The mind will enter deep absorption without any intention. This happens in a flash. One of my teachers told me that he was on the Buddhist pulpit teaching.
While teaching, his mind was also introspecting the Dharma, and he relayed them into words. This process kept continuing until a moment. Where his mindfulness, stability, and wisdom were sufficiently strong, his mind then entered deep absorption and all the impurities were eradicated. The mind then left the absorption. He immediately thought of what he was talking about and resumed teaching. All of this happened in a flash. The enlightenment impurity eradication process took a very short time. We cannot foretell when the mind will be enlightened. So, what we do is practicing as much as possible. When our spiritual faculties or strengths are mature, with sufficient morality, concentration and wisdom, the enlightenment process will occur. No one can make enlightenment occur, but it occurs automatically. When moral precepts, concentration and wisdom are full, this can happen to either monks or lay people. If you continue to walk this path, you will become a monk without needing to be ordained. Your body will still wear pants or skirts, but your mind can become monk-like. Monk means noble or venerable. What is venerable is the mind that is not ignorant. It is not ignorant nor losing out to the mind's impurities. So, we can practice until the mind becomes venerable. Keep the moral precepts. Practice formally every day. Practice samadhi with the mind that is observing itself. Once the mind wanders off, no so. Every practice is based on this principle. The mind will eventually be peaceful and upright. After achieving these qualities, cultivate wisdom. Once the mind is upright, the aggregates will be separated as a direct result. This is so because proper samadhi is the immediate cause of wisdom. The first level of wisdom is separating the aggregates. This will occur automatically if the mind is upright enough. Like, when you walk, you will see the body walking. If the aggregates are separated, the mind will see the body walking, and the body is an object that is observed by the mind. The mind and body are separated. This is an example of aggregate separation. Some people brush their teeth. When you brush your teeth, here's how you brush your teeth. If you do not brush correctly, the gum will be ruined. While brushing their teeth, some people achieve deep concentration, seeing the arms as some object that is not ours. Or, sometimes, when you look into the mirror, you see an object and not see a person, not a living being, nor self. This is how the mind develops itself and separates the aggregates. Once you can separate the aggregates, continue observing. See physical and mental phenomena arise, stay, and decay. This is wisdom development. Continuously practice and eventually enlightenment will occur. This is not difficult. It is possible for a layperson. A layperson can even be fully enlightened. I just told you their stories earlier. There were many lay people who attained full enlightenment. So, do not be disheartened if you cannot get ordained. Once the time comes, karma will arrange it for you. If it is not yet time, do not hurry. Keep practicing. Only after practicing under Luang Pu Dun for a short while, he told me that I could rely on myself. The thought of getting ordained flashed in my mind. That was in 1982. But I had family affairs to take care of. I could not get ordained, so I continued practicing without whining. I felt that once I became ready, karma would arrange it for me. I did not feel rushed, but I practiced a lot. So, for a woman, there is no need to be obsessed about becoming a female monk. That thought will preclude you from attaining enlightenment. The mind will be restless, trying to obtain status.
This is unwise. The mind will be diffused. It is a waste of time. Instead of being diffused, practice. Keep the precepts, practice samadhi, and develop wisdom. Everyone has their style of wisdom development. Some people still wonder. I keep saying that. The four foundations of mindfulness are like four doors. You can enter via any, but when practicing, some see for sequential doors. It starts from observing the body. Then, the mind starts to see the physical feelings. And after that, the mental feelings. Once feelings arise, the mind has already taken action. This leads to the foundation of observing mental composition. The mind sees greed, lust arising with happiness, and anger, aversion arising with unhappiness. So, some students wonder why there are four doors in different directions, and not for sequential doors. Can one practice going through all four doors sequentially? Yes, it is not incorrect. But when you start your practice, pick one. Do not set an alarm clock to observe the body in the early morning, feelings in late morning, mental compositions in the afternoon, and find phenomena in the night. That will not work. The mind will be diffused. So, you can start with any foundation. These four foundations are related. It is like this small table. It has four sides. If you pick up one side, the whole table is picked up. Some people are more skillful at observing the body. What observes the body? The mind does. There are the body and the mind. Some are skillful at observing the feelings. What observes the feelings? The mind does. There are the feelings and the mind. This is also a separation of aggregates. Some are skillful at observing mental compositions. This is not directly observing the mind itself. It is observing the wholesomeness, unwholesomeness, greed, lust, or the lack of greed, lust. The mind will see greed, lust, anger, aversion, delusion, peacefulness, diffusion, and other mental phenomena as something the mind gets to observe. Who observes the mental compositions? The mind does. Before practicing, there is no knowing mind. There are only the minds that are engrossed in greed, anger, delusion, peacefulness, diffusion, or gloom. But once you know how to practice observing the mental compositions, the mind becomes the knower. It sees these mental compositions, whether wholesome or unwholesome, arise, stay, and decay. Or if you practice observing the fine workings of physical and mental phenomena, who does the practice? The mind does. The mind sees hindrances to the stability of the mind. Seven factors of enlightenment, elements, aggregates, senses, and dependent origination working what sees all these things, the mind does. Do you see the main element in all this practice? It is the mind. It is in every practice. If you fully know the body, you will know the mind. If you fully know the feelings, you will know the mind. If you fully know the wholesome and unwholesome mental compositions, you will know the mind. If you see the fine phenomena, you will see the mind and know the mind. It all comes down to the mind. So, Complete eradication of impurities occurs in the mind. The wisdom roots out the impurities in the mind. If the mind is not attaching to anything, then who else can attach? If the mind is not suffering, who will? Keep practicing and developing. There are other discourses, like 16 steps of breath mindfulness. If you study the discourse, the first four steps are about the body. The second four steps are about the feelings. The next four steps are about the mental compositions. And the last four steps are about the finest phenomena. This is another style of full-blown mindfulness practice. It is for someone very skillful, like the Buddha. It is very hard for us to follow those 16 steps. Just achieving the first four steps is near impossible. So, pick the practice that suits you. There are many aspects of Dharma. It is extraordinary and immense. An ordinary person sees four doors that face different directions. Observing the body lets you see the mind. Observing the feelings also does. Observing the mental formations lets you see the mind. Observing the fine physical and mental phenomena eventually lets you see the mind. It all leads to the mind seeing the mind and letting go at the mind. It is possible. 
Some practitioners are not satisfied with this. They start by observing the body. They then observe the feelings, the mental formations, and finally the fine physical and mental phenomena. Some practitioners do it this way. It is possible. But if you cannot do what they can, you can practice simply. Focus on one door. Any door can lead to the liberation of the mind. It is like an ancient city with four gates. The ruler is in the castle in the middle of the city. but is held captive by the rebels. This ruler is our mind. The mind is the supreme leader, but its superiority is not absolute. The ruler is held captive by mental intoxication and ignorance. We can enter the city via any gate and reach the castle. Reach the ruler and eradicate the rebels. The ruler will be free. There are many ways to get inside. The Buddha showed many practices. The more one studies, the more one feels stupid. Studying more does not give the sense of self-superiority, but it shows how enormous and immense the Buddha's enlightened wisdom is. We can hardly know even a tiny fraction of it. The Buddha's wisdom is truly extraordinary. The Buddha's knowledge is supreme. But many disciples also had great knowledge. There are many great teachings of his disciples in the scripture. Have you ever heard of Relay Chariot's Discourse? This discourse is a conversation between Prasar Reboot and Prapu Namantane Boot. Prapu Namantane Boot was born in the same city as the Buddha. He attained full enlightenment quickly, and he also taught Prananda to attain the first enlightenment, so he was very skillful both in his own practice and teaching. He taught his students about ten topics of conversation, which I talked about two weeks ago. They include frugality, contentment, seclusion, solitariness, diligence, developing moral precepts, stability and wisdom, liberation and wisdom that arises from liberation. Prapu Namantane Bhut practiced and developed these ten subjects and he taught his students about them. One day, a group of monks from Kobun Lapud came to visit the Buddha. The Buddha asked whether there is someone who is teaching ten topics of conversation there and is practicing them himself. The monks all named Prapu Namantane Bhut as the one doing so. The Buddha praised Prapu Namantane Bhut as very wise. When the Buddha did so, Prasar Reboot was present. So, he wanted to meet Prapu Namantane Bhut. He then told his students that when Prapu Namantane Bhut came to visit the Buddha, let him know. He wanted to have a conversation with Prapu Namantane Bhut. After a while, Prapu Namantane Bhut came to visit the Buddha. After some conversation with the Buddha, Prapu Namantane Bhut left and went to the border of a forest to find a resting. India was hot. People stayed under the trees during the daytime. Prapu Namantane Bhut brought a sitting mat for meditation. He carried the mat over his head. Why did he do so? Because the mat could block out the sun. He did not have to pretend to have a good manner to endure direct sunlight on his head. He carried the mat over his head and shoulders. Prasar Reboot student went to inform him. He was delighted and carried his mat and followed Prapu Namantane Bhut. When he saw that Prapu Namantane Bhut was resting, he did not disturb him, but took a seat under a nearby tree. In the evening, Prapu Namantane Bhut left deep meditation. Prasar Reboot went in and asked why Prapu Namantane Bhut got ordained. Was it for the purity of moral precepts? Prapu Namantane Bhut said no. Was it for the purity of the view? 
No. Was it for the purity of overcoming doubts? No. It is called purity by overcoming doubt. The name is hard to say, and even if pronounced, requires translation. Was it for overcoming doubt of what is the way or not the way? No. Was it for developing moral precepts, stability, and wisdom? Which is called purity of knowledge and vision of the way? No. Was it for liberation? No. Was it for wisdom that arises from liberation? Knowing whether oneself has any impurity in his own mind or not? No. Prosar Reboot said, These are not what you got ordained. Or did you get ordained for something else besides these things I have asked? Is there anything else further in the practice? Prapu Namantane Boot said no. Prosar Reboot said, You did not get ordained for all the things I asked, and you said, There is nothing further in the practice. Then, what do you really want from monkhood? Prapu Namantane Boot said, Nibbana or Nirvana without any aggregates or final Nirvana. I have to summarize. Time is running out. Prapu Namantane Boot said, these seven purities are like seven relaying carriages. If King Parsentiko Son wants to travel from Sarvati to Sarkit, using a single carriage would take too long, and the horses would tire out. So, he had seven intermediate stations. He changes the horses and the carriages at each station. So, in order to get to Sarkit, it is not because of the first, the second, or any one carriage. But it is not because of any other method. The method is to use all seven carriages. What you said about seven purities is like these seven carriages. Using them leads to Nibbana. Prosar Reboot felt that this is one very wise monk. So he asked for the name, even though he already knew the answer. After Prapu Naman's Hane Boot told Prosar Reboot his name, Prosar Reboot highly commended his wisdom and said fellow practitioners benefit greatly from him. Prapu Namantane Boot did not know Prosar Reboot, so he asked for Prosar Reboot's name, and praised that no one could ask him as good questions as he did. They praised each other. After Prosar Reboot told Prapu Namantane Boot his name, Prapu Namantane Boot might have been stunned a little bit, thinking, Oh, if I only knew this was Prasar Reboot, I would not have engaged in this conversation, since he already knows everything. This discourse is very satisfying. I was very pleased when I read it. This is the Dharma that was explained by the disciples. So, do not look down on these, and aim to learn only from the Buddha's discourses. There were many disciples that could explain Dharma well, and were well respected. That is it for today. Time is up. To summarize, practice. Do not be obsessed about becoming a female monk. You can practice at home. If getting ordained brings a hectic life, like seeking society's approval, and getting involved in internal politics. It is a waste of time. It is better to practice at home and eradicate your own impurities. That is the ultimate goal. Next up is homework submission. Number 1. I formally practice by chanting and doing sitting meditation. During the day, I try to be mindful. Sometimes I am, but mostly I am not. 
Even if I were mindful, my mind was not impartial. The impurities took over the mind. I am very prone to anger. There are many times that I cannot see the phenomena. Am I on the right path? You have practiced well and are on the right path. Be careful not to keep the mind still. Do not fabricate this stillness. Observe the body more. As you love physical beauty. So, keep observing the body and its unattractiveness and undesirability. Once the mind is peaceful, see the phenomena arise and cease. Your practice is correct. Practice more. But do not force the mind to be still. Number two is good. Number two. I use the body as my home base for practice. I am more focused on practice. I feel like I have a purpose in life. Lately, I feel that the world is meaningless. And I feel less involved in it. I do not enjoy fun activities as much. I am not sure whether this is because of my samadhi. What else do I need to do to practice better? Keep practicing. What you are practicing is exactly correct. You practice well. Your samadhi is good. The aggregates separate naturally. Keep observing. Whatever impurity arises, know so. Like, if your mind wanders off to think, know that the mind is diffused. Keep learning about yourself. Stay in the present. Whatever phenomenon arises, know it. All phenomena teach us the same thing. They teach the three characteristics of phenomena. Number two, you practice well. The mind is luminous. Number three. Number three. When I practice walking meditation, the mind gets engrossed in the feet. The mind sees itself as non-self. Sometimes when I chant, sadness arises. The mind knows that it has arisen after it has thought that my practice is still incorrect. This results in my mind lacking strength. During the day, I observe the body, but the mind is lost for a long time. I work using the computer. Can I develop wisdom? Yes, you can. The mind can sometimes separate the aggregates. Do not keep the mind still. When you observe phenomena, the mind wanders off to sea. It dives right into the phenomena. Know this diving in. At that moment, the mind is not sufficiently upright. Can you see? The mind dives into see vision, hear sound, or dives into think, or dives into overfocus. The mind also dives in to seek out what to observe. It is wiggling inside. No, so. It will get better. You practice well. Be patient. Number two, see that once the mind is intending to practice, tenseness and heaviness occur. Right now, the mind is not natural, it is tight. Number four. Number four, I chant before practicing sitting meditation. During meditation, the mind is diffused, I know so. I keep observing and use breathing as the pillar to eradicate diffusion. I feel hot in my chest. During daily life, I become mindful more often. Am I doing insight development correctly? It keeps getting more correct. The mind is upright and the aggregates are starting to separate. After this, see every phenomenon that the mind knows as temporary. Happiness comes and goes. Unhappiness comes and goes. Greed, anger, and delusion also come and go. Keep knowing and observing comfortably. Do not be tense. Right now, do you notice that the mind just dove into knowing something? The mind has been absorbed into it. Pull it out. Do not get drawn in. Breathe heavily. Tilt your face up. Tilting face up does not mean stretching the body up. The mind right now is different than before. 
can you see? Before, the mind got absorbed. Do not let it be so without knowing. Keep the mind awake. Be mindful, awake and blissful. Do not let it sink into stillness and dullness. Keep practicing. Keep observing. I teach you only about the mind. If you practice correctly, when you practice peacefulness, you will use the right mind to know the practice object and attain peacefulness and be upright. Wisdom development requires using the right mind, which is upright, to observe the workings of the phenomena. So, the mind is very important. Right now, the mind has wandered off to think, no so. Be mindful often. Do not worry about peacefulness. Keep observing the mind's workings and disregard peacefulness. Keep seeing the mind's ever-changing nature. See it alternating between happiness, sadness, good and bad. Keep observing like this. Pray and chant to the Buddha every day. Number 5 is doing well. Number 5. I formally practice by doing walking meditation for 40 minutes a day. I then observe the body that is breathing and moving, and I see the mind as the observer. During daily life, the mind gets lost for a long time. I see the mind wanting to be good. I see happiness and unhappiness arising right in the center of my chest. I can accept the truth more and feel like the world is more distant. I know that I do not know something. Am I seeing this correctly? Yes, you are. You practice well. Keep practicing. Do not be greedy. Do not seek results. Only intend to practice every day as an offering to the Buddha. Do not do it for yourself. If you take this perspective, the mind will not be restless and the practice will be comfortable. Number two is still restless. No so. Practice as an offering to the Buddha and not to attain anything, even enlightenment. Number 8. Number 8. I keep the moral precepts. During my daily life, I observe the body and the mind. I see the working of the mind more clearly. Every day during the evening, I formally practice by doing walking and sitting meditation. I feel that I get stuck, because when I do a sitting meditation, the mind gets colder and colder, and then the mind enters some silent period, before it returns to observe breathing before leaving the practice. Am I doing it correctly? Yes, you are. Practice every day. If anger arises, no so. Whatever impurity arises, no so. Your formal routine is good. In daily life, keep knowing the mind's impurities that arise. Number one. Your mind is used to forcing itself to be still. You must fix this, or there will be no progress. The mind will only be peaceful. Know the craving to practice. This craving is the cause of you keeping the mind still. This is action. Cravings are impurities. Keeping the mind still is action. Result, fruit of kama, is the numbness of the mind. This is not so refreshing. Number 6. Number 6. I formally do sitting meditation in the morning and before bedtime, for 30 to 45 minutes a day. During daily life, I see the body breathing, moving, and working. I see the mind wander off the body to think. I see impurities. I see my ego and arrogance. Some days, I can see the mind that wanders off to think clearly. This can be blurry on other days. I see the mind clinging onto things I want to do. I see it running around and fabricating things. It feels heavy. Please advise. Know things as they are. Keep practicing. Things will be better. How does one know that one is getting better? 
The duration between lost minds will be shortened. Your mind will know itself if it is so. The mind will be more detached from the world. Numbers 2 and 5. Your minds are more detached from the world. After completion of practice, the mind will be above the world, but not in a physical sense. There is no distance, there is nothing. This is about the mind. Number 6. Do not be so keen to be good. Keep observing the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body and mind. Let sensing occur. Once sensing happens and the mind changes, no so. But you must do a daily praying, samadhi and walking meditation. These things strengthen the mind. Then, develop wisdom. Let the senses contact objects and observe the changes that occur in the mind. Number 7 Number 7. I use breathing and mindfulness as my home base. The mind likes body movements more than sitting still. During daily life, I see the body and mind working clearly. I sometimes see the mind struggling and reaching for something and see some action as a result. I see the mind vibrating. When there is contact between a sense and an object, when the mind wanders off, it gets blurry. If the mind is upright, the mind is clear, centered, and upright. I am not sure whether I intentionally keep the mind still. No, you are not keeping the mind still. You practice well. Keep practicing. To see whether you are intentionally keeping the mind still, see its weightiness. If you intend to keep the mind still, the mind will be heavy. Keeping the mind still a little bit here and there is quite normal. But if heaviness and dullness occur, it is incorrect. It wastes time. Number 7. Breathe. Let me see you breathe. Good. Keep breathing and observe the mind. Be mindful. Breathe and you will see whether the mind has made some movement. Do it like this. Good. Come out to make contact with the world. Let the mind be in contact with phenomena and keep knowing its changes. Good. Today, many people practice well. I appreciate and approve. That is all for today.